In the midst of America's retaliation for 9-11, a relatively small force of UK Special Forces personnel were soon to see action in the deserts and mountains of Afghanistan. As for the SAS, two squadrons, A and G, have been deployed as part of Operation Determine, a reconnaissance and bomb damage assessment mission. Whilst better than being stuck at home on SP or anti-terrorist duties, or on training, as was the fate of B and D squadrons, Op Determine was still as dull as a ditch water. It seemed that the Americans were wary of committing ground troops in force, preferring to rely on air power coordinated with the Northern Alliance troops. In late November 2001, the SAS received orders to attack a large opium storage facility slash Al-Qaeda base located close to Afghanistan's southern border with Pakistan. 60 to 100 fanatical Al-Qaeda fighters were holed up and dug in around the heavily fortified base. For the Americans, the operation was low priority. They were more interested in finding bin Laden and no high value Al-Qaeda or Taliban figures were thought to be on site. If it wasn't for British pressure, the US would probably have decided to decimate the base from the air. UK planners suspected that the base would yield some vital intelligence which would require men to go in and get. In order to coordinate with US airstrikes, the attack would have to go in mid-morning, a frontal attack on an elevated fortified position in broad daylight. Without any real intelligence or close reconnaissance, it was extremely dangerous. Some might even say foolhardy. But the orders required an attack as soon as possible, and so the SAS planners went to work. The plan was as follows. Air troop would halo jump into the desert to secure and mark out a temporary landing zone for six C-130 planes to ferry A and G squadrons into the area. Both squadrons, some 120 plus men in 36 vehicles, most heavily armed Land Rovers, known as Pinkies, would ten drive from the landing zone to a forming up point. At 11am local time, G Squadron would form a fire support base and engage the Al-Qaeda positions at standoff range. American aircraft would destroy the opium depots. Under cover from the FSB and airstrikes, A Squadron would assault the opium base and sweep for intelligence materials. Under cover of the FSB, A Squadron would withdraw from contact, followed by G Squadron. On the night before the main insertion, Air Troop performed the regiment's first ever halo insertion into enemy territory. The eight-man team jumped from a C-130 cargo plane at high altitude, only opening their chutes at the last moment. Once down and secure, Air Troop tested the proposed landing zone, ensuring that the desert could support the weight of a fully laden Hercules transport aircraft. Next they marked out the outline of the landing strip. With one part of the team keeping an eye out from within a concealed OUP, the rest of the team hid in an LUP. When A and G squadron arrived in the two waves of six USC 130s, air troop guided them in using infrared torches. Before the huge transport planes could come in to a full stop, their rear ramps were down and SAS Land Rovers were speeding out and off, moving in all around defensive positions. Within half an hour, the C 130s were away, only soon to return with the rest of the SAS force. Not long after that, the SAS columns were organised to move out. Aside from the Pinkies, several ACMAC trucks and a number of Scout motorcycles were brought along. Acting as motherships, the ACMATs were powered high with spare ammo, fuel and water. The motorbikes were used to scout ahead of the columns, providing the routes in and out and keeping a lookout for enemy who could be laying in ambush anywhere along the route. Darkness, the men and machines of A and G squadrons, the largest wartime concentration of SAS firepower, headed off to a laying up position to await the time to move on for the attack. As the Land Rover columns manoeuvred into position, they visually acquired their objective, a group of buildings at the base of a small mountain. 
Al-Qaeda defenders soon spotted the dust thrown up by the SAS column and started arsing RPG fire down in their direction. The pinkies of G-Squadron lined up and poured suppressive fire onto the Al-Qaeda positions. The FSB continued to provide suppressing fire, pounding the Al-Qaeda defences with their HMGs, GPMGs, MK-19s and Milans. Snipers armed with Barrett rifles engaged Al-Qaeda targets, accounting for many of the enemy dead. In a pre-arranged attack, US Navy F-18 Hornets fired Maverick missiles into the opium storage depots, destroying them and the 50 million pounds worth of opium in sight. The A Squadron closed on the fortified positions. Several SAS troopers were wounded, one seriously. The Al-Qaeda fighters were not particularly well trained, but they were fanatical fighters. The SAS had to fight hard for every inch of progress. Eventually, A Squadron assault force reached the objective. They moved in and cleared the HQ building, gathering all intelligence materials they could find. The battle had taken four hours. Scores of dead Al-Qaeda fighters littered the battlefield. The regiment had taken relatively light casualties. The SAS then carried out a tactical withdrawal, covering each other as they pulled off target. Once a safe distance from the scene of the battle, the four wounded were casivacked out by US Chinook helicopter. The lowest number of Al-Qaeda terrorists and Taliban fighters killed is 18. Other sources put the figure at 73 Al-Qaeda killed. Several dozens more were wounded and captured, though no high-level Al-Qaeda leadership were amongst those killed or captured. By the 18th of December 2001, Members of A Squadron and G Squadron were back at their base in the UK. Members of both squadrons were awarded a total of two CGCs, one DSO, two MCs and several MIDs. The strategic significance of the facility has never been fully explained.